It was the first time I heard about menstrual cycle awareness, how powerful it would be to ground into my own body and start listening to my body, which with my history was not the norm. And I just knew how much it feels like putting on this armor against outside influences. A lot of times the messaging and harm imposed upon us by this high demand religion of Mormonism that we share. Can menstrual cycle work? How can the wisdom of our own bodies be such a powerful antidote to that so that then we can step into our own sovereignty where we are the authority for our own lives because we know ourselves so well, which again was not the case in Mormonism where everything is rely on these external male spiritual authorities. Welcome to the Wild Flow podcast with me, Charlotte Puanto, an award-winning menstrual cycle coach and priestess and the founder of First Moon Circle School. I guide women to honor and embrace their sacred cycles in their life, leadership, and business. Let's say hi to more ease and flow by co-creating with your body and goodbye to struggle and burnout. This podcast features soul-enriching conversations, inspiring you to love your cycle, lead as a sacred leader, and grow a life and business that serves you by harnessing cyclical life and business practices. Join me and other change makers, thought leaders, and wise women to embrace and embody your wild flow. Today on Wild Flow, I'm chatting with a client of mine and a peer and somebody who I really admire, Elizabeth Tidwell from My Club Red. Elizabeth is a womb guide and menstrual cycle coach who helps bring women and menstruators into their bodies to learn vital body literacy and she facilitates a deeper relationship between menstruators and their cycles, their bodies and their whole selves. Elizabeth grew up Mormon and over the last few years has not only left the church, but has been on a really powerful healing journey of discovering her menstrual cycle here in a seasons and that as a path to reclaiming sovereignty, trust in her body, in her power and in self-trust so that she could leave the church and stand strong and tall in herself and break the patterns and the conditioning and the narratives that she grew up surrounded by, indoctrinated with, that being a woman, being feminine, being a, a cyclical was a problem. She grew up in purity culture with total disconnection to her authentic strength. So I really, really love chatting to Elizabeth today, talking about what it was like for her to grow up in this Mormon culture and how she found her way out of the church and how she has called in a community of ex-Mormon women and is guiding them now on a path to understanding their bodies and cycles. Elizabeth is also a First Moon Circle facilitator and she teaches children about the power of their bodies and cycles as well, as well as offers a first period kit under her business, My Club Bread. In this conversation, we really talked about what it takes to show up as a menstrual cycle guide, as someone who really stands for um, autonomy and sovereignty and cycle wisdom in a culture where there is a lot of shame and stigma and oppressive power um, by people who are still involved with the church and how she helps people to to leave behind um, these stories and experiences um, that they grow up with, especially when friends and family are still involved with the church. This is a really powerful conversation for anyone who has grown up with or been involved with um, organized religion, but also for anyone who is afraid or hesitant about stepping forwards into their community and being seen for doing the incredible work that you do uh, when it feels unsafe perhaps or stigmatized or that you're really not just going against the grain and doing something a bit alternative, but where you're going up against um, religion and leaving communities that you you have been a member of and standing forwards for what you really believe in. So this is a beautiful conversation um, and I hope that serves you on your path. 
Elizabeth, welcome to Wildflow. How are you today? Oh, I'm so good. So happy to be here. Me too. I'm so excited to chat with you. Let's start off as always with a cycle check-in. And I'd really love to invite you to just feel into where you're at in your body and your cycle and to share with us how that feels for you. Um, so where, where are you at today, Elizabeth? What's your cycle check-in look like? How do you like to do your cycle check-in? Yeah, I am cycle day 22 and I'm going to be honest, I had to go and count it out and I, it's possible it's a few days off because I, it's been a whirlwind and I'm kind of so excited that I'm coming to the end of this cycle. I recently was just traveling. I just barely got a colonoscopy, like everything's been crazy. So I'm very eager to come into this final phase to finish out this cycle and just kind of settle into late inner autumn and come into my bleed time because I'm ready for the rest. So mm. Mm. I hear you. I feel that I'm cycle day 23. So there we go. Yeah. I'm matchy, um, matchy. That's going to be interesting for like a, yeah, a matchy matchy vibe. <laughs> um, I too, um, uh, have had quite a big cycle just with uh, school holidays and then getting the kids back into school and um, just feels like there's been a lot going on personally and kind of a bit of a whirlwind and I feel like just that deep ah, like exhale Mm -hmm. slowing down exactly what you're saying and just that kind of like okay it's time to cocoon Um, I'm really looking forward to that but it's going to be my middle kids birthday bang on (laughs) when I'll be retreating into that that's kind of that cave time where I just don't don't really want to talk to anyone Um, and I don't really feel like I've got the capacity for socializing or even to be like quite excited I sort of I'm like oh I just can't I just can't even fake I'm not (laughs) very good at faking it um people have always said to me especially my husband um I don't have poker face (laughs) so (laughs) what you see is what you get so um I just can't really hide it very well. So I'm just hoping to be able to slide down the hill this week uh, into a soft place where I can be really present for her and enjoy her Mm. and celebrate her, but also not feel like I need to kind of put on a particular face that, Mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think we do that, don't we? We're like, oh, I need to be super mom or chatty chatty. And I'm like, Mm. oh. Yeah. So that's going to be an interesting, uh, I guess, negotiation, kind of tussling with that a little bit for myself this week. Oh my God. <sighs> I totally feel you because I am also throwing a party in like a week. <laughs> I'm like, what, are, really? what is happening? Yes, we are on the same level. And I'm like, how can I simplify this? Because I tend, like, I love gatherings. I love making things special. My daughter's been begging me for this Winnie the Pooh party. And I'm like, okay, we have the time. But, yeah, when I was looking at my cycle, I'm like, oh, okay. How how can I make this so easy on myself instead of pretending that I'm, like, in ovulation phase and showing up like that? And nobody else expects that of, like, you know, the little kid parties I throw. But I ready to release that for myself because I get really caught up in it I love that so much releasing that for yourself it's true nobody else does expect that it's just that ingrained for me anyway that ingrained like you know how we're taught to like and and told and shamed to like put on a smile smile love might never happen Mm -hmm. it's like Mm -hmm. cheer up um and yeah I still have that voice in my head when I'm not smiley happy it's like I'm a grumpy bitch and it's like well maybe I am and like that's just tough that's just how I'm at so um yeah that's so interesting we actually had the conversation this morning about with my kid that when we're gonna have a family thing for her birthday which will be Sunday and we're gonna actually do her party in a couple of weeks because she wants to go to the theme park (laughs) of course she does And I'm like, no, I just, no, that needs to wait. So yeah, that's a really beautiful thing. How can I make this really simple? I'm going to make it simple and that's what we're going to do. So Mm. love that. Love that we're like so aligned in so many ways. (laughs) Wild. 
<laughs> so Elizabeth, we're going to have a beautiful chat today um, about you and your work and your your life really and how it's guided you to do this particular work that you're doing and how you're being such um, a guide um, for women and people who've who have have periods and cycles but who've you know as part of a bigger story than that are undoing their patriarchal um conditioning stories shame how all of all of um you know organized religion as well is um and as you've called it high demand religion is you know affects our relationship with our bodies and ourselves and you know this is just like such a big um a big topic and I'm really excited to have this chat with you and hear about it um so I think just to start with because you and I know each other um from well connecting online I think first Mm -hmm. and seeing the awesome work you're doing um as a menstruality guide a menstrual cycle coach um and then we have done the first moon circle facilitator training together as well um Mm -hmm. but I'd love to just hear from you um I think if you'd like to just share with us, what is it about this work, being a menstrual cycle coach, um, doing this first moon work, what is it about menstrual cycle work that really spoke to you and called you into to doing this? Um, it, as the focus of your work as well, what is that core thing that really um, lights you up and calls you to do this? Yeah, um, I think... For me, it was the first time I heard about menstrual cycle awareness. It was immediately I felt how powerful it would be for me to ground into my own body and start listening to my body, which with my history was not the norm. And I just knew how much it feels like putting on this armor against outside influences to be able to anchor into myself. And I knew that I really wanted to help others build that same anchoring into themselves so that they can build this big buffer um, that protects us from all the messaging that comes from outside of us that wants us to feel a certain way about our bodies or our cycles or our femininity or all sorts of things. We get messages all the time that really have such hold on us but that is my biggest desire is to help others anchor into themselves and be able to yeah to be able to tune out and disregard all the messages that are always coming at us because when you're grounded in how you are which is I feel like the gift of menstrual cycle awareness is such an appreciation and understanding of how you are in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That is like the most potent, yeah, buffering and armor and protection that I've ever experienced. And I certainly wanted to help others experience. I love that. I think that's really, really powerful, Elizabeth. I really hearing you um, and connecting with that uh analogy or metaphor or the the visual sense for me the energetic sense of when you say we really anchor down into our bodies um that we can then you know I guess what you're speaking to for me it feels like self-trust and Mm self-knowing and self-acceptance and really just letting that rise up within us and buffer us as you said and so we've got this deep core this foundational knowing that actually we are meant to be like this we are accept ourselves as we are and that we can then repel away these really harmful stories about how we should be which actually don't align with how we actually are so that constant feeling of we're not living up to um what's expected of us um what's normal um according to these these outside messages and so just really drawing up that that core of of strength and knowing I think that's a really um, a powerful um, expression and, and visual for me. It, it reminds me of trees deeply rooted mm. in our own knowing and then, you know, our branches kind of pushing all that BS away. Exactly. Exactly. So whereabouts in the world are you? And 
what's the culture like where you are and where you grow up um, around menstruality and, you know, women's bodies particularly, but um, would you just share with us what it's, it's been like for you uh, in your upbringing? Yeah. So I am from Idaho in the U S and I currently live in Utah um, so out in the West over here and both of those states and especially where I am now is like Mormon capital. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the dominant culture is this very highly religious, very patriarchal religious culture. Um, where I grew up, it was a little more evenly mixed with Mormons and non-Mormons, but it, it was still so prevalent that that was for sure the dominant culture for me and then layering that with a very orthodox mormon family upbringing so yeah just lots of the particular messaging and how it landed for me growing up in that culture is just the best way i could describe it is just total disconnection action of any sort of authentic strength in being um a woman or someone with a cycle it was all definitely i feel like there's a lot of just lip service done to women in the church culture of like yeah you guys are so important and yet in lived experience nobody was valuing uh our contribution or you know our bodies and we were actually like i definitely received plenty of messaging growing up and it's pretty prevalent in this particular culture of like purity culture so like you your worth depends on how your morality for sure and also like we are responsible for males thoughts about us and just lots of lots of messages about what it means to be a female that really were not healthy or supportive and that's why it was like such a powerful lightning bolt moment to hear at like 31 years old 32 that my body and my cycle were wise and powerful and right and good just as they are like I don't have to try I I really grew up trying to be a boy because I knew that I would be safer have more power have more respect have more freedom um, even from a very young age so that all those messages really permeated my relationship with myself. And I know I'm not alone in that, in, in this particular culture too. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's really, really powerful. Um, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. I, um, haven't had a religious upbringing at all, actually. Um, I, you know, I went to a church of England school and we would go to church for festivals. Uh, but, but that was really, really it. So to hear your experience is, is one that I, I definitely don't um, have as a lived experience. And I'm really um, grateful for you sharing, you know, giving us a snapshot into um, into that world and to how, um, I guess, the messaging and, and it, you know, works as control um, mm. over the women and, the, and I'm, you know, hearing as well the girls in, in, in the culture. And I'm just really interested that... Um, you know, it was menstrual cycle awareness that that kind of gave you this path out of that. That, um, mm-hmm. which are you happy to share with us what that looked like for you when you um, started to unravel those stories and the messaging and um, you know your participation in, in in the church in that way? Yeah, yeah. So I actually left the church right before I had my daughter because I knew that I didn't want to raise her in this environment. Um, But at that time, I hadn't heard about menstrual cycle awareness. And I kind of took a big two-year hiatus from anything spiritual at all because I knew I needed this like palate cleanser. Like my soul needed this palate cleanser to step out of any sort of Uh, spiritual manipulation or pressure or judgments or morality based on what other people say. So always knowing that I would come back to some sort of spiritual practice because it's super important to me, but I knew that I wanted it to look and feel nothing like how it had been and certainly not for my daughter. So um, 
fast forward two years when I was ready, I was interested actually in like um, witchery because I was like, oh, this is like so different from how I experienced spirituality and accessing spirituality. And it was like pretty and fun and anything goes. And it was all based in like what I experienced as connecting. And that was so big for me. And from there, that's when I started um, learning about just the concept of cyclical living. And for me in Utah, I had pretty a uh, significant seasonal depression because it gets pretty dark and cold for a long time here. Um, so I really had a very hard time in winter in particular. So I that's how it kind of unfolded that I began to even pay attention to how important the outer seasons are and how there are different opportunities in the outer seasons, which really primed me and my awareness and my openness to... Um, Really soon after that is when I learned about uh, menstrual cycle awareness through a serendipitous book recommendation that I overheard in a huge Facebook uh, group that it wasn't meant for me, but I just saw it and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. So I read Wild Power by Alexandra Pope and Shawnee Hugo Wurlitzer. And then that, yeah, that blew my mind. And that was kind of... I think the fact that I had already stepped away from the church, but I had not deconstructed or evaluated the impact that the church had had. But I think that time that I gave myself to just set everything aside was really fertile ground. Because if I had read that when I was a Mormon, I do not know if it would have landed for me because I was so very much you know, condi conditioned to be a good Mormon girl. And there's just so much that Mormons are taught is dangerous and not, not okay. And we're like pretty much taught to only engage in kind of approved things, essentially. And not that anybody would have been like, you can't read that book, but there's just a vibe of like, that's weird. That's not what you should be into. And you don't need anything beyond Mormonism. So yeah, I think giving myself that break before really helped me be able to hear my own voice when I first encountered um, Wild Power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine the book as being something you would have had to have like hidden. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whilst you were trying to read it. And, and but then even like you say, it, it probably wouldn't have landed in the way that mm -hmm. it, it did after you connected with the outer seasons, the earth seasons and how that was influencing you. And I love that that's the, been the way in for you because I share that um, real experience of the earth seasons as being something that really has always been there. You know, I've always lived somewhere seasonal. Um, and had that real appreciation, but that moment where you suddenly go, ah, oh, we're the same. It's mm -hmm. a mirror of our internal world. You know, if, whether we have a menstrual cycle, it's very, very prevalent and it's strong day to day and over a month. But even when you don't have a menstrual cycle, we all experience the seasons and the day rhythm and you know, if anyone are tuned to the moon, we can see how that waxes and wanes as well. So I really, um, I really love that that was your, your way in, um, and through that book, which is just such a powerful activator for so many. Mm. So yeah, I really, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, and, and so from that place then, um, what was it that, um, made you decide or, or sort of gave you the, Oh, maybe the confidence or the the clarity that you felt really called to guide others into this work, especially in a culture where it was not open, um, where mm. it might be taboo, um, perhaps. I'm I'm curious. And and what's that been like for you to step into this and claim this in a culture, in a place where I imagine that there's some quite, you know, a polarity in terms of openness and attitudes towards uh the work you do yeah um well <laughs> I like I knew in the 
in the middle of reading that book that I ultimately did want to help other people do the same, have these same connections and opportunities and knowledge. Um, it took me, oh, three, four years to work up the courage and follow through <laughs> to create specifically for ex-Mormons. Um, because, and, and then when I was, um, advertising the, about two months ago, it brought up a lot more, um, insecurities and fear of visibility and fear of pushback and fear of, um, yeah, like I'm going up against this kind of big monolith and a lot of my family and surrounding community, like they're, they're, Mormon believing members. And so it, it shook me more than I thought, because like I said, I, I originally left the church five years ago and it's been a long time and I have done a lot of deconstructing work and I am now very confident in where I am, but it was, it opened up more layers in being visible and being public. Um, I think that was, you know, subconsciously holding me back is like, am I ready to stand not only for myself, but for others and kind of be this beacon for a whole new way of relating to yourself. And also <laughs> like the pushback that I got was so much of this is made up. This isn't a problem. What are you talking about? Like, like women are treated well, our bodies are great. Everybody knows that. And, and of course, if you don't have um, the openness to see that something could be different, then that's how you're going to see it. Right. But definitely resonated with a lot of ex-Mormons, um, which I was, you know, very relieved, knew that it would because, uh, it was, it's such a different message than how we were raised. And even though I had left years ago, it's such a long process and never ending process to recalibrate, uh, your relationship with your body and your cycle and step out and kind of fully rid yourself of the the conditioning. I don't know that it's ever work that's done because it's all so deep and so it, like happens in our formative years for most of us. So um, yeah, there there was a lot that arose for me and I was ultimately like really grateful because it it not only am I providing this group container for other ex-Mormons who are so excited about it? And we've had a, a great group push through another barrier that I didn't realize was there. This, this barrier of the fear of standing so visibly and publicly as an ex-Mormon helping ex-Mormons. So very grateful for, honestly, really proud of myself for being able to do that and doing it scared <laughs> and um, and discovering even more strength and power and so much community was waiting for me on the other side of that. That's incredible. I uh, just, uh, real hats off to you. It's one thing to step forwards and become, you know, a menstrual cycle coach and to declare yourself for this work just generally, you know, without... Mm -hmm this layer and this very thick <laughs> layer um, of, <laughs> of, you know, of, of being um, ex-Mormon and calling in specifically ex-Mormon women, you know, building up the community as, you know, in, in real, in, in a, in a sense of, well, in rejection, but, you know, in defiance and, you know, mm -hmm. in opposition to, to this, you know, these deeply strongly held beliefs that, are held not just by people in your community, but as you say, by friends and family as well. That takes immense courage. And I'm I'm really in awe of you because I think a lot of people who do this work feel a bit of, you know, like the witch wound, it might be called, or um, like that fear of stepping forwards and mm -hmm. being seen as doing something that's weird and taboo and um, ick even. And mm -hmm. like, you know, just people don't get it. Um, but to add on, like you say, you're standing against a monolith and, you know, you also called it like a patriarchy within a patriarchy, which mm -hmm. it really, it really is. And, you know, so I think to, um, to be doing that and to find that through that process 
you've called in these women who, you know, like you, you're all out there, you're all on this um, unlearning, reclamation, healing process that, you know, like you say, could last a lifetime, even, you know, more lifetimes. Mm. Um, Might be something that, you know, could be intergenerational um, and ancestral. So, you know, to really call each other in and to do this in solidarity um, I just think it's such a powerful, um, like, it's just, it's so inspiring. And I just think for anyone who's listening, who's like, you know, I really want to step forwards and do this, but I'm scared of what people might think. Um, like you're such a, um, an inspiration and a, and a way shower in, in that sense, because yeah, it, it definitely can be intimidating and scary. So to hear you saying how much power, you've reclaimed through this process of stepping forwards um, and um, solidarity and community that you've called in and to to realize that they're all just there waiting for you. I think that's incredible wisdom uh, for others as well as you know, incredible to hear that it's it's been your experience. Yeah, it's like, um, it, it's like the action aspect of menstrual cycle awareness, this, this whole process of I'm untouchable now (laughs) you know what I mean like what now that I've faced this fear and or implemented menstrual cycle awareness both of those kind of those parallels um it's moving from what we anticipate in our brains or intellectualize or imagine and then moving it into our lived reality it feels yeah just I've grounded so deeply in like fully aligned with what I'm here to do, what I want to do, what I'm going to do. And the actual implementation of that really helps reconfirm that, that spaciousness around myself and around anyone like stepping into that place um, by, by kind of, I don't know, shaking off all of the the outside voices it actually helps you be so much so much better able to like shake them off easier every time in the future it's it's really powerful mm. yeah amazing and something else that you're really standing for in your work that i've you know witnessed you stepping into through the first moon circle work is your um you're really advocating for all people in in community to learn about menstrual cycle awareness. So first moon circles are, you know, they're aimed for children. Um, it's menstrual education for, uh, you know, that goes beyond what's offered in schools. Um, and it's it's really holistic and, and nurturing. And we talk a lot about cycle self-care as well as, um, you know, the facts of what cycle it, uh, cycle is and periods and puberty are on the biological aspect that that spiritual um self-care the inner seasons framework um all of that is included too and something that you've been really passionate about is is offering this to you know the, the the children in your community but also working with different um sectors of 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 community who might not readily have access to this kind of education um, you know, for the young people and for adults too. I'd just love to hear and, and would you like to share with us about um you know the the work you're doing and the way that you're sharing your circles and you know what your belief is about um you know access to this kind of education. Yeah, absolutely. Um so yes, it's been such a pleasure to bring first moon circles to Utah and to Mormon Utah. Um yeah. cuz again, it's like so powerful to be able to start menstruation with this huge leg up, but also it's so powerful to have the mother's wisdom ceremony at the end because I'm like that is where we really cement that this is intergenerational work, right? That this Mm. matters in homes, this matters in communities, this matters far beyond the huge impact that it has on the girls and kids coming. But like this is going to change communities and and we need that. We really need that. Um, So I've been so 
pleased at the response in my community. And again, Utah now does have a lot of ex-Mormons that are way more open to even just the fact of talking about bodies, that kind of thing. So um, I am also looking forward to hosting more where I do actually get I'm really hoping I get access to more practicing Mormons because it would have made a difference to me as a preteen girl in Mormonism. And of course, nothing really goes against Mormonism in first moon circles. So I'm really hoping that the more I show up in my local community, the more that I can really kind of speed up that ripple out effect. And I super really want to help reach um reach beyond just girls and moms and anyone with a period i'm really passionate about helping dads and boys and anyone without a cycle come to learn about how vital it is for everyone to understand recognize appreciate and empathize with cyclicality and just how vital it is in our culture and our world and in our families and communities to to really honor the experiences that half of us go through and recognize that you know dads don't have to be awkward or like often there's so much mm, silence and relationships start to get some distance when girls go through puberty and I'm like I we don't need to do that we can actually just learn together and um yeah really support each other because if you without that support um we're really not serving not only the girls of the younger generation but also the boys like they totally are showing up now ready to be compassionate witnesses and like protectors of space and like I love um, so I also um, offer first period kits and I love whenever I talk to moms of boy of, you know, packing a first period kit in my son's backpack so that, he, you know, he's surrounded by girls all day or like he's got a sister or like, you know, be that friend in the group that isn't afraid to talk about everybody has needs. Everybody has the capacity to help. And I love just bringing that awareness, like, of course we can do this. This doesn't have to be weird or awkward or shameful. This just can be, and it can be an opportunity for all of us to connect. Love every single thing you just said there. I think that's so powerful. We're, so we're teaching the girls, we're opening up, you know, the the household conversations with mums. So it's not just something that, yeah, I find that even when I just say to the girls, you know, like, um, you know, your mums, your grandmothers, every, um, everybody, you know, every woman has had, um, a, a period, you know, at some point in her life before you, you're not the first, yeah. um, you won't be the last. They kind of take this like collective, like exhale, like, oh, okay. It's not just like this giant thing that's like, yes. you know, pressure on them to figure out, but then also acknowledging that, you know, it goes wider than that. Like, it's not just the responsibility that's, that's theirs to carry, um, you know, and we can change that story of it being a burden um, that, you know, girls have it so hard. Um, you know, they right. have to have, have periods and then give birth. You know, that's an old, an old chestnut, an old story that, you know, I, I think has been circulating forever. And it's like, well, we're reclaiming the positivity of it. But then I just love the, what you said there about bringing in, um, you know, boys, um, dads, um, and just really honoring that it's not just the girls who, who have the, the periods it's, you know, it goes beyond that as well. Um, there's a wider spectrum of experience and then empowering those who don't have periods to be allies, to be the support and that they aren't just bystanders, that they actually have a role to play in that. And really love hearing that mums are, are passionate about taking on your amazing first uh, period kits as well. Oh. Love that, yeah. that you're giving them a way to be helpful and to, um, you know, it's, it's just as simple as carrying that kit in their bag. But what a powerful statement. Like, I'm not ashamed to put this in my bag. I'm not ashamed to have this conversation with you. I'm not ashamed to stand for you and your needs. Like that just like, you know, gives me 
shivers in all the good ways. Yeah. And, um, you know, especially in a, in a culture where there has been, you know, a lot of, um, well, you say there's a lot of ex-Mormons now, but, you know, that religious reach um, oh. has been really, really strong, yes. um, and, and, you know, and still is and probably will be for a long time. So yep. to be able to be allies in the face of that, um, that's just, that's incredibly powerful. Yes, it is so important. And I mean, kind of like as the facilitator of a first moon circle, when I show up and say, hey, I'm willing to talk about this without shame, it it allows them to also step into, step away from shame themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And so the same thing happens whenever anybody, you know, like you're talking about with boys with period kits in their backpack, it invites so much less shame. And that mm-hmm. alone is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Incredible. So has the reception generally been, uh, has it been mixed for you? Has it been positive? Um, what's it been like for you as you've put this out into the community? Yeah, I really, really hoped it would, you know, take off like wildfire and just go everywhere. Um, but, and I've talked to a friend who um, still is a practicing Mormon, but very nuanced and such a wise light for her particular Mormon community. Um, and she, she teaches girls about this age and she's like, yeah, I've shared it with all the parents, all the moms and, uh, they, they don't even respond. And I've been getting that a lot as well. So I think there is definitely a lot of work to do around finding the people who are ready right now, which mm-hmm. can then again, ripple out and then help, help open up pathways to those who maybe aren't quite ready yet, or maybe it still feels just a little too far out there. Or I do get a lot of moms who are very leery about anyone teaching their kids about anything to do with their bodies. And mm-hmm. that's Mormons and non-Mormons alike in in the Valley here. Um, lots of moms who are like, no, we just don't allow anyone that is not mom or dad to to talk about anything that has to do with puberty, bodies, anything at all. So that can kind of, I mean, I definitely see the the value in that in some ways, but I also, that one's, that one's kind of a little bit tricky and a little bit of a bummer for me because um, it, there's just such a different vibe when you have access to other adults that like, I was not comfortable talking to my mom about this at that age. You know what I mean? So like sometimes it can really be a big, a big help to the child to be able to have someone outside of just a parent to talk to but of course, respecting parent wishes. So like there's actually quite a lot of dynamics at play, I feel like in this, just my location. Um, but I am excited to keep I, like I, there's such a need here that I definitely want to keep um, making it available, spreading awareness. And hopefully, even if they don't attend, they'll at least start thinking about it if they see a flyer or patients with themselves and at home, um, these moms who might see advertisements about this. So I, I definitely realize that I'm in it for the long haul. I think that's really um I think that's really real, actually. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing that because I think I think we're at this point in time where it's becoming so much more open and um I guess it not not mainstream, it's still fringe, but you know, there's this like opening where people are sort of, you know, talking about it more and so you know, the more that people hear about it and the more that it's it's like, you know, it's there, then I think with time people are like, you know, okay, so what is it you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Like there's this real curiosity about it. And, you know, what you said there is so important as well about um, access for children to uh, adults, responsible, trusted, safe adults who are not their parents. And we know that, you know, um, that children really need that from a mentoring point of view, from a community point of view, that 
you know, it's one of the um, the risk factors um, is when children don't have access to um, a network beyond their their family, especially as they get to puberty um, and into the teen years. They really need to have people that they can look to um, for advice and support and guidance and to get that sense of like there's other perspectives than just what the parents have. Because if they don't have access to that, you know, at that age where their brains naturally start to look outwards away from the family unit anyway, then they either look to their friends um, and, you know, their peers are perhaps as uninformed or misinformed as they are. So they're not actually getting access to any Mm. guidance or, um, you know, children can can look for help in, in, in places that aren't as safe or trusted for them. So like being able to bring in that network um, is, is, you know, really powerful part of, of, of this work of, of first move circles and, you know, what you're here to do as well. It's, it's offering that outside perspective of, Hey, have you considered this? And, um, you know, here's someone you can talk about it and ask the questions that just feel completely impossible to ask your own parents. Yes. Um, and so having access to this is one of those protective factors that that um, helps children, you know, grow up and, and be well-rounded, safe, um, autonomous, sovereign, um, mm. well-adjusted people as they as they go through to adulthood. So I think it's something that that's really important. It's just how do we, you know, get around this? And in some communities, it's um you know, when there's all these layers of um, um, gatekeeping, as you said, um, it can be quite a challenge. But yeah, just really um, glad that you're here to do this and, and to be that beacon of light. And I've, you know, found that through my own community as well. Um, you know, it's it's been for me just that ripple effect of, you know, holding one circle and then getting the positive feedback and then the people talk about it. They're like, Hey, I went to this thing. And then it Mm -hmm. goes, it's been going from there for me over, over the years where, you know, it sort of spreads and spreads. Um, and then the siblings want to come because they're like, Hey, I want my turn. I want to come and have the experience you had and get my little booklet and my, my, um, you know, learn, learn the stuff and have that special time with, with mom. Um, so yeah, may it be so. And, And I think for sure that there's, parts of the world that are definitely um there's there's these challenges these real cultural challenges um to, to work around especially with religion so it's really interesting to hear how it's 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 playing out for you um but just so excited that you know you found your way in um especially through your program sovereign um for ex-mormon women um yeah. and i'm sure that that's going to be really really powerful um to, to sow the seeds in your community of of resistance <laughs> as well yeah. as you know education and acceptance and um and reclamation of of the cycle and um feminine power absolutely so I'd love to know um for anyone who's listening who wants to find out more about that is that something you'll be running again and, and um do you want to just talk to us a little bit about sovereign like what's involved as well Yeah, love to. So yeah, it's called Sovereign, Menstruality as a Healing Tool for Ex-Mormons. And this first round, um, I'm definitely planning on doing it again. And already they're they're asking for me to make it more widely available because they keep talking about it. So there's such a need here. And um, it is an eight-week group experience there are some learnings that we'll do together about um, the menstrual cycle. But again, with the lens of where are we coming from with this shared cultural religious context of a lot of times the messaging and harm uh, kind of imposed upon us by this high demand religion of Mormonism that we share. And then how can menstrual cycle work? How can the wisdom of our own bodies be such a powerful antidote to that so that then we can step into our own sovereignty where we are the authority for our own lives because we know ourselves so well, which again was not the case growing up in Mormonism where everything is 
rely on these external male spiritual authorities. Um, so it's a really powerful um, group experience to also not only learn this um, content about yourself and come into this knowledge that will be super transfor- transformational to not only like apply a critical lens to what you've experienced in Mormonism and how it might be showing up. Um, and then also this this new lens of menstruality work, but also such a great community um, opportunity. Community, so many of us ex-Mormons lost so much of our community by leaving the church because Mormonism, as a high demand religion, it is uh, a part of your everyday life in every single aspect. And you're, uh, for a lot of us, makes up huge amounts of our community, huge amounts, like the people that I interacted with until I left the church were Mormon because you just surround yourself with Mormonism. And that is, um, especially if you're in the West where Mormonism is so prevalent. Um, so it's, it's really hard to completely lose community in the ways that you experienced it before. So it's so beautiful to journey this together and build our own communities here. And then part of what we do at the end of Sovereign is also make sure that you do have community outside of just this group program and making sure that, um, yeah, you're supported in a way that's going to give you such a powerful foundation moving forward. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's incredible. I just think it's it's such amazing work and I can absolutely see, as you said, you know, not just the knowledge of the wisdom of your body and your cycle, but that connection to each other so that, you know, you're not isolated in doing this journey, um, you know, of leaving the church and, and, you know, rediscovering yourself outside of that. You're not doing it alone um, in yeah. isolation. And so that, you know, I can see that being such a, a beautiful place to belong to, um, you know, during the program and, you know, and beyond as well. Um, yes. so yeah, just incredible, incredible work. So Elizabeth, um, I just love to invite you to share with us. Um, you know, if, if someone's listening and they are, you know, I guess, tussling with I'm not sure whether you know so many of our listeners would be you know in organized religion um or um you know in in a place of of leaving this but if if anyone's listening who's in a place of questioning you know kind of everything that they thought they knew about mm. their body and their capacity and um you know there's there's cycles um and what it means to be um feminine or um you know a woman um what would be your suggestion for them as the first place to start? Um, you know, what's what's maybe a beginner tool or practice or um, you know, something to just help people to take that next step out of um, you know, on, on that questioning journey. Yeah. Um, this is going to sound way too simple, but it's actually so powerful if you have lived a long time not listening to your body. And it's really just to start giving yourself small moments throughout the day to ask your body questions and listen to the answers. And also just like respond when your body gives you cues that we're so used to dismissing. So when your body gives you hunger cues, feed it. When your body says, I need to go to the bathroom, don't wait 20 more minutes and go right then, right? So building a relationship of trust, it's this two-way relationship that we, we, if you're like me and a lot of the people in my community, we just have not built a two-way relationship with our bodies. And I think that is such an important, but also very powerful place to start because you can immediately start seeing that your body is always listening to you and is always responding to what is going on in your life and is always there to guide you into much deeper alignment with your own deepest needs. And I think that is, it sounds so simple, but it also sounds foreign to a lot of us to just like ask our body questions or actually serve our body's needs. And that is a beautiful place to start building a relationship where you can then really deepen however you'd like to. 
That's so true. What a gorgeous invitation to listeners. I think it's really, really true. And I think that even when we are, um, you know, away down the path into this kind of work, I think that actually, you know, honoring our body's cues can be something that we still forget to do. Mm -hmm. I know that Mm -hmm. sometimes I can do that. And particularly at certain times of my cycle. So there's that Mm -hmm. lens on it as well. I think that's, you know, what a beautiful um, framing of that to listen to and serve our bodies. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Yes. So how can people come and find out about you and your work and um, if they're interested as well, particularly, I guess, US-based listeners who want to find your first period kits or your first moon circles, um, where can we connect with you and discover your work? Yes. So my website is myclubred.com. And you can explore all the offers there and you can also connect with me. I love connecting on Instagram at myclubred. Beautiful. And do you offer one-on-one work as well outside of your programs? Yes, I do. I have a couple of spaces open right now. So if you're looking, one-on-one work is such a, it's a different thing than a group program because the group program I get to um, interact and teach and guide, but a lot of, it can't go as deep on the personal application. So one-on-one work is such a great way to get your very personal access to how does this apply to me? How, like if something's coming up and you're struggling with it, um, yeah, one-on-one work is a really great gentle daily practice and really start doing that deeper work that we just can't access together in a a group format. So yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing about your incredible work and, you know, the, the, the depth of, of what it really means to do this work as well. Um, especially in a culture where it has been, um, you know, it's meant distancing yourself from what you knew and who you knew and stepping into, um, you know, really brave, empowered version of yourself and then being that guide to other people as well. Um, and thank you for sharing about your work. It's it's really incredible. And I hope that, you know, this episode has been really insightful, but inspiring as well for um, for, for people. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being with mm, us on Worldflow. Thank you. I loved it so much. Thanks for this great conversation. And just a little invitation from me. If you really would love to be able to support other people, particularly children, to discover the power and the positivity and the magic of puberty, of starting to have a menstrual cycle and of the female body, then you might be interested in studying with me in the First Moon Circle Facilitator Training. Applications are opening this October for our January course start date, where you'll be guided to learn all about rites of passage and how they support us and initiate us from one phase of life into the next. They teach us how to support children in terms of community, in terms of knowledge development, in terms of inviting them to be held in circle, as well as how they learn and how they can really, really learn to witness and support and embrace their body as it changes from child to adolescent. You also learn everything you need to know about sharing and teaching menstrual cycle knowledge to children as well as how to hold beautifully nurturing, empowering, safe and inclusive spaces. Plus you receive business support from me to help get your circles up and running. Become part of our school and global community of First Moon Circle educators who are taking this information out to our families, our friends, the children and mothers in our communities as well as fathers and sons into schools and online. Together, we are working at the forefront of this movement to creating a period positive world. This is a really in-depth, rich training that will serve you to create your own offers as well as to hold first moon circles. 
and to share this information with adults as well as children and in other ways as you feel really called to do. If you're interested, discover more at firstmincircleschool.com where you can also join the waitlist to receive your invitation to apply when doors open up this October 2024. We would be absolutely honored to welcome you in if you feel a passion to teaching this knowledge, to creating a period positive world and to giving children the positive experiences that we wished we'd had when we were young too. I hope you will consider joining us. Thanks so much for listening to Wild Flow. I love having you here and hope you loved this episode. If you did, please show your love by leaving a rating and review and share your fave episodes with your cycle and biz sisters and those who haven't yet discovered the power of their body and cycle. This is how we collectively create change and heal the sisterhood. It makes such a difference. Thank you for sharing. Haven't discovered your cyclical leadership style yet? Take my free much loved quiz now to receive your free in-depth playbook on how to up your sacred leadership, grow your business and thrive by embodying your cyclical archetype. Go to charlottepointo.com slash quiz now. Until next time, be devoted to your body as guide and your cycle as oracle.